The Queen of Sheba is a figure first mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. In the original story, she brings a caravan of valuable gifts for the Israelite King Solomon. This account has undergone extensive Jewish, Islamic, Yemenite and Ethiopian elaborations, and it has become the subject of one of the most widespread and fertile cycles of legends in West Asia and East Africa. Modern historians identify Sheba with the South Arabian Kingdom of Saba in present-day Yemen and Ethiopia. The Queen's existence is disputed among historians. Yemen was successively incorporated into the Ethiopian and Persian Sassanid empires. In the 7th century, Islamic caliphs began to exert control over the area. The Queen of Sheba whose name is not stated, came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels bearing spices, and very much gold, and precious stones. Never again came such an abundance of spices as those she gave to Solomon. She came to prove him with hard questions, which Solomon answered to her satisfaction. They exchanged gifts, after which she returned to her land, the use of the term idit or riddles, an Aramaic loanword whose shape points to a sound shift no earlier than the 6th century BC, indicates a late origin for the text. Since there is no mention of the fall of Babylon in 539 BC, Martin Knopf has held that the Book of Kings received a definitive redaction around 550 BC. Sheba was quite well known in the classical world, and its country was called Arabia Felix. Around the middle of the first millennium BC, there were Sabaeans also in Ethiopia and Eritrea, in the area that later became the realm of Aksum. There are five places in the Bible where the writer distinguishes Sheba, the Yemenite Sabaeans, from Saba, and the African Sabaeans. In Psalm 72 verse 10 they are mentioned together, the kings of Sheba and Saba shall offer gifts. This spelling differentiation, however, may be purely factitious, the indigenous inscriptions make no such difference, and both Yemenite and African Sabaeans are there spelled in exactly the same way, although there are still no inscriptions found from South Arabia that furnish evidence for the Queen of Sheba herself, South Arabian inscriptions do mention a South Arabian queen. And in the north of Arabia, Assyrian inscriptions repeatedly mention Arab queens. Makeda or Makeda, the personal name of the queen in Ethiopian legend, Ethiopian, 17th century AD painting of the Queen of Sheba from a church in Lalibela, Ethiopia and now in the National Museum of Ethiopia in Addis Ababa, the most extensive version of the legend appears in the Cabra Nagast, Glory of the Kings, which is the Ethiopian national saga. Here Menelik I is the child of Solomon and Makeda, the Ethiopic name for the Queen of Sheba, she is the child of the man who destroys the legendary snake King Arwe, from whom the Ethiopian dynasty claims descent to the present day. While the Ethiopian story offers much greater detail, it omits any mention of the queen's hairy legs or any other element that might reflect on her unfavorably, based on the Gospels of Matthew, 1242, and Luke, 1131, the Queen of the South is claimed to be the Queen of Ethiopia. In those times, King Solomon sought merchants from all over the world, in order to buy materials for the building of the temple. Among them was Tamron, great merchant of Queen Makeda of Ethiopia. Having returned to Ethiopia, Tamron told the queen of the wonderful things he had seen in Jerusalem, and of Solomon's wisdom and generosity, whereupon she decided to visit Solomon. She was warmly welcomed, given a palace for dwelling, and received great gifts every day. Solomon and Makeda spoke with great wisdom, and instructed by him, she converted to Judaism. Before she left, there was a great feast in the king's palace. Makeda stayed in the palace overnight, after Solomon had sworn that he would not do her any harm, while she swore in return that she would not steal from him. As the meals had been spicy, Makeda awoke thirsty at night and went to drink some water, when Solomon appeared, reminding her of her oath. She answered, Ignore your oath, just let me drink water. That same night, Solomon had a dream about the sun rising over Israel, but being mistreated and despised by the Jews, the sun moved to shine over Ethiopia and Rome. Solomon gave Makeda a ring as a token of faith, and then she left. On her way home, she gave birth to a son, whom she named Ebn Hakim, son of the wise man, later called Menelek. 
After the boy had grown up in Ethiopia, he went to Jerusalem carrying the ring and was received with great honors. The king and the people tried in vain to persuade him to stay. Solomon gathered his nobles and announced that he would send his firstborn son to Ethiopia together with their firstborns. He added that he was expecting a third son, who would marry the king of Rome's daughter and reign over Rome so that the entire world would be ruled by David's descendants. Then Binalikam was anointed king by Zadok the high priest, and he took the name David. The firstborn nobles who followed him are named, and even today some Ethiopian families claim their ancestry from them. Prior to leaving, the priest's sons had stolen the Ark of the Covenant, after their leader Azarias had offered a sacrifice as commanded by one God's angel. With much wailing, the procession left Jerusalem on a wind cart led and carried by the archangel Michael. Having arrived at the Red Sea, Azarias revealed to the people that the Ark is with them. David prayed to the Ark and the people rejoiced, singing, dancing, blowing horns and flutes, and beating drums. The Ark showed its miraculous powers during the crossing of the stormy sea, and all arrived unscathed. When Solomon learned that the Ark had been stolen, he sent a horseman after the thieves and even gave chase himself, but neither could catch them. Solomon returned to Jerusalem and gave orders to the priests to remain silent about the theft and to place a copy of the Ark in the temple, so that the foreign nations could not say that Israel had lost its fame, according to some sources, Queen Makeda was part of the dynasty founded by Zah Basai Angabo in 1370 BC. The family's intended choice to rule Aksum was Makeda's brother, Prince Nurad, but his early death led to her succession to the throne. She apparently ruled the Ethiopian kingdom for more than 50 years. The official chronicle of the Ethiopian monarchy from 1922 claims that Makeda reigned from 1013 to 982 B.C., with dates following the Ethiopian calendar. In the Ethiopian Book of Aksum, Makeda is described as establishing a new capital city at Aziba, according to one tradition, the Ethiopian Jews, Beta Israel, Falashas, also trace their ancestry to Menelikai, son of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. An opinion that appears more historical is that the Falashas descend from those Jews who settled in Egypt after the first exile, and who, upon the fall of the Persian domination, 539 to 333 BC, on the borders of the Nile, penetrated into the Sudan, whence they went into the western parts of Abyssinia. Several emperors have stressed the importance of the Kabra Negast. One of the first instances of this can be traced in a letter from Prince Kassa, King John IV, to Queen Victoria in 1872. Kassa states, There is a book called Cabra Nagast which contains the law of the whole of Ethiopia, and the names of the shums, governors, churches, and provinces are in this book. I pray you will find out who has got this book and send it to me, for in my country my people will not obey my orders without it. Despite the historic importance given to the Kabra Negast, there is still doubt to whether or not the queen sat on the throne, Islamic, the temple of Awam or Marambulkis, sanctuary of the queen of Sheba, is a Sabaean temple dedicated to the principal deity of Saba, al makkah frequently called Lord of Am, near Marib in what is now Yemen a Muslim country, I found, there, a woman ruling them. And she has been given of all things, and she has a great throne. I found that she and her people bow to the sun instead of God. Satan has made their deeds seem right to them and has turned them away from the right path, so they cannot find their way. Quran 27 colon 23 24. In the above verse, Ayah, after scouting nearby lands, a bird known as the Hud Hud, Hupu, returns to King Solomon relating that the land of Sheba is ruled by a queen. In a letter, Solomon invites the queen of Sheba, who like her followers had worshipped the sun, to submit to God. She expresses that the letter is noble and asks her chief advisors what action should be taken. They respond by mentioning that her kingdom is known for its might and inclination towards war, however that the command rests solely with her. In an act suggesting the diplomatic qualities of her leadership, she responds not with brute force, but by sending her ambassadors to present a gift to King Solomon. He refuses the gift, 
declaring that God gives far superior gifts and that the ambassadors are the ones only delighted by the gift. King Solomon instructs the ambassadors to return to the queen with a stern message that if he travels to her, he will bring a contingent that she cannot defeat. The queen then makes plans to visit him at his palace. Before she arrives, King Solomon asks several of his chiefs who will bring him the queen of Sheba's throne before they come to him in complete submission. An Ifrit first offers to move her throne before King Solomon would rise from his seat. However, a jinn with knowledge of the scripture instead has her throne moved to King Solomon's palace in the blink of an eye. At which King Solomon exclaims his gratitude towards God as King Solomon assumes this is God's test to see if King Solomon is grateful or ungrateful. King Solomon disguises her throne to test her awareness of her own throne, asking her if it seems familiar. She answers that during her journey to him, her court had informed her of King Solomon's prophethood, and since then she and her subjects had made the intention to submit to God. King Solomon then explains that God is the only God that she should worship, not to be included alongside other false gods that she used to worship. Later the Queen of Sheba is requested to enter a palatial hall. Upon first view she mistakes the hall for a lake and raises her skirt to not wet her clothes. King Solomon informs her that is not water rather it is smooth slabs of glass. Recognizing that it was a marvel of construction which she had not seen the likes of before, she declares that in the past she had harmed her own soul but now submits. With King Solomon, to God, 27 colon 22 44, God, she was told, enter the palace. But when she saw it, she thought it was a body of water and uncovered her shins, to wade through. He said, Indeed, it is a palace, whose floor is, made smooth with glass. She said, My lord, indeed I have wronged myself, and I submit with Solomon to God, Lord of the worlds, Quran 27 colon 44, 57, the story of the Queen of Sheba in the Quran shares some similarities with the Bible and other Jewish sources. Some Muslim commentators such as Al-Tabari, Al-Zamakshari and Al-Badawi supplement the story. Here they claim that the Queen's name is Bilkis, probably derived from Greek, according to some, he then married the queen. While other traditions say that he gave her in marriage to a king of Hamdan. According to the scholar Al-Hamdani, the queen of Sheba was the daughter of Ilshara Yadib, the Sabaean king of South Arabia. In another tale, she is said to be the daughter of a genie, or peri, and a human. According to E. Ullendorf, the Quran and its commentators have preserved the earliest literary reflection of her complete legend, which among scholars complements the narrative that is derived from a Jewish tradition, this assuming to be the Targum Shani. However, according to the Encyclopedia Judaica Targum Shani is dated to around 700 similarly the general consensus is to date Targum Shani to late 7th or early 8th century, which post-dates the advent of Islam by almost 200 years. Furthermore, M. J. Berdachevsky explains that this Targum is the earliest narrative articulation of Queen of Sheba in Jewish tradition, in short in the biblical account of the reign of King Solomon, the Queen of Sheba visited his court at the head of a camel caravan bearing gold, jewels, and spices. The story provides evidence for the existence of important commercial relations between ancient Israel and southern Arabia. According to the Bible, the purpose of her visit was to test Solomon's wisdom by asking him to solve a number of riddles. The Queen of Sheba questioned the wisdom of King Solomon and traveled to see whether he could live up to his reputation. The Midrash relates how she created several scenarios to test King Solomon and was impressed by his responses. She also posed four riddles to him, all relating to gender and family. The queen was so overwhelmed by King Solomon and God's miracles that she converted to Judaism after visiting Solomon, the queen of Sheba heard of King Solomon's great wisdom and declared, I will go and see whether he is wise or not, and I will come to test him with riddles. She came to Solomon and asked him, Are you the Solomon about whom, about whose kingdom, and about whose wisdom I have heard? He replied that he was. She then said to him, You are truly wise, now I will ask you something, and we shall see if you are capable of answering me, to which he responded, 
for the Lord grants wisdom, knowledge, and discernment are by his decree. Proverbs 2 verse 6. The Queen of Sheba asked, What are the seven that issue and nine that enter, the two that offer drink, and the one that drinks? Solomon answered, The seven that issue are the seven days of menstrual impurity. The nine that enter are the nine months of pregnancy. The two that offer drink are the breasts, and the child is the one who drinks, the Queen of Sheba exclaimed, You are truly wise, I will put another question to you, and we shall see if you can answer me. He responded, For the Lord grants wisdom. She asked him, How can a woman say to her son, Your father is my father, your grandfather, my husband, you are my son, and I am your sister? Solomon replied, The two daughters of Lot, who became pregnant by their father and bore sons, when the queen of Sheba saw that he solved her riddles, she brought before him children who were of the same height and who were in like attire. She asked him, Distinguish between the males and the females. He made a sign to his eunuchs, who brought him nuts and roasted ears of corn, which they scattered before the children. The males, who were not bashful, collected them and tied them within the hems of their garments. The girls, however, were bashful, since their bodies would be revealed if they were to tie their undergarments, and therefore tied them within their outer garments. Solomon told the queen, These are the males, and these are the females. She told him, You are exceedingly wise, the queen of Sheba brought a number of people before Solomon, some circumcised and others uncircumcised. She asked of him, Distinguish between the circumcised and the uncircumcised. Solomon immediately made a sign to the high priest to open the Ark of the Covenant. Those who were circumcised stood or bowed their bodies to half their height, while their countenances were filled with the radiance of the Shekinah. The uncircumcised, however, fell on their faces. Solomon immediately told the Queen of Sheba, These are the uncircumcised, and these are the circumcised. She asked him, How did you know? He explained to her, from Balaam the uncircumcised, of whom it is said, who beholds visions from the Almighty, prostrate, but with eyes unveiled, Numbers 24 verse 4. If he did not prostrate himself, he would see nothing. I also learned from Job, for when the three friends of Job came to console him, he told them, Job 12 verse 3, I am not less than you, literally, I do not fall from you, I do not fall like you, for you are uncircumcised, while I am circumcised. The queen said to Solomon, But I did not believe the reports, of your wisdom, until I came and saw with my own eyes that not even the half had been told me. Your wisdom and wealth surpass the reports that I heard. How fortunate are your men and how fortunate are these your courtiers, who are always in attendance on you and can hear your wisdom. Praised be the Lord your God, who delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. It is because of the Lord's everlasting love for Israel that he made you king to administer justice and righteousness, 1 Kings 10 verses 7-9, Midrash Proverbs, Buber edition. 1. According to another tradition, the Queen of Sheba's praise was mainly for the righteousness that she saw in Solomon's kingdom, which is why she ended with the words that he made you king to administer justice and righteousness. The third riddle indicates the differences between males and females that are already noticeable in young children. And is connected to the shame felt by girls at publicly exposing parts of their bodies, Solomon's wisdom is evident in his knowledge of human nature. The last riddle regards male sexuality and distinguishes between someone who underwent circumcision and one who remained uncircumcised. Solomon shows that this physical difference has spiritual consequences, since these two groups exhibit disparate religious behavior. King Solomon's ability to answer the queen's four questions is indicative of his wisdom, since he is as cognizant of female nature as of the male character, the Queen of Sheba appears as a prominent figure in the Cabra Nagast, Glory of King, the Ethiopian national epic and foundation story. According to this tradition, the Queen of Sheba, called Makeda, visited Solomon's court after hearing about his wisdom. She stayed and learned from him for six months. On the last night of her visit, he tricked her into his bed, and she became pregnant. She returned to her kingdom, where she bore Solomon a son, Menelik. Menelik I was made king by his father, thus founding the royal Solomonic dynasty of Ethiopia, 
which ruled until the deposition of Haile Selassie I in 1974.